So, hi everybody. Um, last year I came and did an Ignite talk and I managed somehow miraculously to memorise the entire five minute talk, but this time no chance I'm afraid, so I'm going to have to use my notes. Um, okay, so I want to kick things off with a poem. Um, don't worry, it's not one that I wrote. Um, I'm going to now have to navigate the tech to uh, get the poem up. You might, have, you might have heard this before. It's always worth hearing again. Okay, let's pray it works. Open up your mind, make some rhythm come in. Open up your brain, do some reasoning. Open up your thoughts so we can connect. Open up for knowledge and intellect. Open up the speaker, make me blast the sound. Open up the sky, make the beers come down. Open up your eyes, make me look inside. If you want to understand this, open wide. Open up your house, make the refugee come in. You might overstand and start helping. Open your imagination, go for a ride. If you want to overstand this, open wide. Open up your fists and welcome a kiss. Get a load of this, open up business. <laughs> open up your bank account and spend. Open up your wallet and check a friend. Open up the dance floor, make I dance. Open up your body and love romance. If you have not opened up, you have not tried. If you want to overstand this, open wide. Open up the border, free up the land. Open up the books in the Vatican. Open yourself to any possibility. Open up your heart and your mentality. Open any door that you confront. Let me put it straight, sincere and blunt. Narrow-mindedness must run and hide. If you want to understand this, open wide. Oh, did it just stop? Hey, cool, that worked. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about continuous learning. And, and those words by the late Benjamin Zephaniah um, tell us, I think, a lot about... Um, what learning is or should be, in essence. Um, because despite what we're often led to believe, um, it's not actually about accumulating knowledge or progressing through a system, although, of course, learning can enable these things. Learning is actually a process of making connection. And it's those connections that build change potential. And we can't make connections without that openness or availability. And I think, for me, that's what Zephaniah was getting at with his poem. So if you remember nothing else from the next 20 minutes or so, um, remember openness, um, because I think it's one of the most important tools to have in your learning toolkit. Openness to what, though? Um, well, to all of these things and, and more besides. Um, and this is really important to consider. Um, if you're seeking to affect learning and change in other people too, um, first you need to think about how open they are. And if they aren't yet open, um, think about how we can get them there. And, and perhaps that's why I wanted to um, invoke some Zephaniah at the beginning of this talk. Um, and an analogy that we could also used to think about the importance of openness for learning and connection is the analogy of the church door. Um, there might be some holes in this analogy, sorry. Um, so I'm not actually religious at all, um, but it happens that my dad's a vicar, and so I did have to spend a lot of time in churches um, as a child. Um, and something that my dad was always very strict on was that church doors should always be open. Um, and you can test this out for yourself if you're on a nice little walk in the English countryside and you come across a little church, um, try the door. Um, it quite, it's quite likely that it will be open and you can just wander inside and you can have a moment to yourself. Um, because that's... The point of that is to allow someone that space for reflection um, through which might come connection and change potential. Um, unfortunately, and somewhat paradoxically, I think, as more and more knowledge has become codified and we've learned to read and, and we've institutionalised and industrialised learning, um, often as a form of control, um, and to advance our capitalist agenda. Um, 
And we've, we've tended to focus more and more on the efficiency with which we can imbibe knowledge and grasp new skills and ship new technology. Um, I think this has sometimes sadly come at the expense of that reflection and connection. Um, and I can't help but wonder sometimes if we lose sight of what learning is really meant to be about. Um, and again, I look at this consumption uh, of information, this obsession with sort of rapid consumption of information um, and of making it sort of shareable and appealing um, as kind of like the intellectual equivalent of processed food. Um, yeah, it can be really delicious and profitable and it can, um, it can make us hungrier for more. Um, but I sometimes wonder if it could also be bad for us sometimes, perhaps bad for learning at times. Um, because I, I believe learning should be effortful, um, not in a bad way, but we need to make space for it. Um, so the, the good news is that we don't have to accept that sort of rapid consumption model. We can choose to make healthier choices around learning and, and grow healthier systems. And it might take a bit longer and it might take more effort, but the results will be better for us. Um, and better for our relationships, better for the products that we build, the artifacts we create, um, and the organisations that we choose to serve. Um, okay, so that was a bit of a, an extended introduction, so I'm going to introduce myself now. Um, I'm Sorrel Harriet, and I'm wearing two hats at the moment. Um, my larger hat at the moment is as a research software engineer at Leeds University, um, which if you're not familiar with the role of a research software engineer, it basically involves providing sort of more specialist computing services and training to, um, to researchers to support them with their research. Um, something I'm learning at the moment is how to navigate some of the crazy outlandish architecture that they have on Leeds University campus. Hands up if there's any Leeds alumni in the house. Oh, I've got... got a, yeah, Roger Stevens, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so my smaller hat um, is as a learning coach and consultant um, with a focus um, on enabling continuous learning in software teams. And I kind of like this fact that one of my hats is about enabling engineers to learn and the other one's about enabling learners to engineer, um, kind of. So there's going to be four connecting themes I'm going to try and cover in this talk. Um, so we're going to start with the why of continuous learning. Why does it matter? Why should we care about it? Actually, I think Patrick kind of already answered this earlier. So I don't have too much work to do on that one, I don't think. Um, but then we're going to apply a systems thinking lens and dig into what it means to be a learning system. And we're going to think about how our behaviours as individuals can affect the learning capabilities of the whole system, something that we might refer to as learning citizenship. So we'll look at that. And then finally, we're going to think about what should be in our continuous learning toolkit. We've already had some ideas today. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to dig deeper and come up with some more. So in other words, what are the social and technical practices that can support and enable learning? And there will be some opportunities for you to contribute your um, thoughts and ideas about this. Okay, next slide. How do I get there? Right. So in my introduction, um, I talked about what I think learning is really about. Um, but we might still wonder what's that got to do with software engineering um, when we're just building stuff and that kind of consumerist model for learning, it kind of... It's, it's kind of reasonable and fits, fits our purposes in many ways. Um, and as I said, I think Patrick kind of gave us some good reasons why that's not really the case. But anyway, I'll carry on. Um, so I begin to, challenge that, to begin to challenge that sort of way of approaching learning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a, a visually appealing and shareable graphic. Um, <laughs> So this, this particular graphic is making the point, it's making a good point, that learning at work used to be very front-loaded. 
Um, admittedly, not for all professions, but for many. And, and that was uh, because of how we worked and the nature of the work and the systems that we worked within. But then, as the kind of need arose for people to work in a more iterative and incremental fashion, um, as systems began to strive for greater agility, um, learning started to happen more continuously um, in intervals, which might we might refer to as sprints. Um, so I'm going to um, change the title on the, the bottom chart because I think this, this kind of packaging of learning into neatly spaced intervals, I think we, we can do better than this still. We need to go further than this now. I don't think that learning, this learning workflow, is going to quite cut it in, in the era of continuous delivery and fast flow that we find ourselves in now. Because we're dealing with a lot more uncertainty, a lot more complexity, a lot more ambiguity um, than ever before, which Heather's already brilliantly reminded us about. Um, nobody's tech infrastructure is simple anymore. Uh, another shareable graphic for you. Sorry, I'll, I'll stop with the shareable graphics. Um, so all that uncertainty and complexity is increasing our cognitive load. Um, now, I, I don't know if this isn't going to be a talk about cognitive load. Um, there's some great talks out there. There's one I saw the other week uh, by Laura Weiss and Alex Morgadis. It's a good one to go and have a look at. Um, but not only is all of this complexity and uncertainty, it's, it's not only increasing our cognitive load, um, but it's also fueling that shift towards uh, more flow-based operating models. So, so in, in flow-based operating model, we're, we're striving more for that continuous flow of value. And, and I think I'm, I'm quoting Matthew Skelton when I say this, that 10 releases a week um, isn't impressive anymore. Maybe it was 10 years ago, but it's not anymore. So I think the graph needs to look a bit more like this now. Um, learning is integral to the work that we're doing, and it's kind of impossible to separate them out. So it needs to be truly continuous for us to handle all that complexity and uncertainty. And we'll find that there's even more to this if we start to look at things through a systems lens, um, because it's really not enough to define learning so narrowly in terms of skills and knowledge acquisition, because they're just one aspect of whole systems learning. And I'm giving a nod here to uh, Sanger's Five Disciplines of a Learning Organization. Again, I'm not going to go into it. Go look, look it up. Um, but just to point out that whole systems learning encompasses so much more. Um, but still, frustratingly, working in the L&D space, there's... It doesn't, I can't find many examples of L&D departments in, in large organisations that don't seem to sort of fixate on the personal mastery chunk of this. Because, of course, we're all systems that learn, and together we form social systems, and we build and maintain technical systems. And so all of these things interact and form socio-technical systems. And, and we can't really think about these things independently anymore, um, the interactions between things matter. So for those complex socio-technical systems to be capable of change and adaptation, we really need to be building learning capability into them. And this is, I'm not, I'm not dissing plural site or anything, but there isn't a plural site course for that, not really. Um, you can't find out how to do that on Stack Exchange. Um, so we need to give some thought. We actually need to stop and think about what it means to be a learning system and how do we recognise and build learning capability into a system. Oopsie daisies, I'm skipping ahead. Um, okay, sorry. I may... I'm struggling a little bit for time now, but we'll, we'll do it anyway. We'll see how it goes. Um, I wanted to just get some of your thoughts on this. What are your characteristics? What are some characteristics that you would associate with learning systems? 
So here you might think about skills or character traits or behaviours that you would perhaps associate with learning. Um, perhaps you can think of some common ones that you might apply to different kinds of system. Um, so you can go to menti.com, sorry, menti.com, uh, and we'll see if anybody's got any thoughts on this. Oh, if it's going to load. Uh, if it doesn't, we'll abandon this. Uh, might have to give up on Menti. Maybe it's just overloaded with all the great ideas that you're having. All right, well, maybe that's not... That's, maybe, that might help us out with timing. But, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, something to think about anyway. Um, okay. Right. Okay, here's some I made earlier. Um, so the, the column on the left highlights six um, that I kind of honed in on because I think that these sort of characteristics apply to different types of system, to social and technical systems. But I think it's how that they're embodied that changes depending on the type of system that we're thinking about. So that's what the other two columns are trying to sort of illustrate there. Um, but the point is that all of these characteristics, we can cultivate them. Um, and, we, and the way that we cultivate them is by consciously practicing um, specific learning behaviours or tactics, um, behaviours like seeking feedback and active listening and reflective questioning and all that great stuff, um, or tactics like doing pair programming and code reviews good code reviews, obviously. Um, and, and those kind of behaviours and practices, they then become our tools for learning. And continuing on this idea then of learning as a capability of, of a system, I want to briefly touch upon the concept of learning citizenship, which is attributed to Etienne Wenger and Bev Trainer. So Wenger's one of the learning theorists behind situated learning theory. And that's um, a theory about learning that, that views learning as an inherently social activity. So in, in social, in situated learning, the interactions between people, so their behaviours, their shared interests, their goals, all of things, these things matter and shape the knowledge that's created. So, so you can't decontextualise the um, knowledge that's created from the situation where it's happening. So in, so in that sense, we can think about the spaces that we inhabit with other people as learning spaces. So this is a learning space. Outside, getting a coffee, that's a learning space. Or at least they have the potential to be learning spaces, depending on how we choose to engage as participants in those spaces. And it's that choice that we have um, to increase the learning potential in our interactions with others that's the heart of learning citizenship. And we can apply that as well when we're thinking about technical systems too. Um, and Wenger and Trainer have suggested, they've gone a bit further and suggested that these, these three particular sort of attitudes and behaviours have the power to transform um, an encounter into a learning experience. So caring to make a difference, that's kind of seeing a chance to make a change or improvement. When you enter into your code reviews, you know, do you care? <laughs> you know? um, engaging with uncertainty. Oh, sorry, I keep doing this. <laughs> it's because it's I'm using PowerPoint. Uh, right. Engaging with uncertainty and paying attention. So being open to the feedback that's all around us. And if we exercise these attitudes and behaviours in our interactions with one another, um, then we can increase the social learning capability between us. Okay, 
So I'm not going to try and do Menti again. I, I mean, you, you can, if it works for you, by all means, put stuff in because I'll look at it later. But I'm not going to try and go there now. Um, but I wanted to have you think about what social and technical practices enable learning. Um, or what would you like to have in your continuous learning toolkit? Um, so these might be things that you already do, or they might be things that you feel you should be doing. Um, and as I said, we've already had some great examples already today, and I'm sure there's going to be more to come. And yeah, if you, if you do get a chance and you want to go and contribute some ideas, I'd really like to get them. Because what I'd like to do, ultimately, is to kind of build a toolkit. This is just a concept at the moment, really. Um, a, a sort of toolkit which brings together all of those great social and technical practices that can support learning. Um, I'm going to give you... Because I've still got, I've got four minutes. Wow, without that mentee, I've got loads of time. Right. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, I'll give you one today. Um, we've already had a few. We've had code review, haven't we? I'm going to give you processing pauses because this kind of links back to what I said at the beginning. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't expect you to read all that text now. But the idea of just allowing spaces in your day to actually just stop and think and process what, what you've been through, what, you're, what you've experienced. Um, it might be that you want to write things down or go for a walk or just check in with yourself. Um, but just give yourself little, little spaces in your, in your day. Um, so that, and yeah, many more. But yeah, the idea is that, you know, maybe between us we could build this into something that could be useful as a kind of reference. Maybe it could even be a deck of cards that you could use, you know, try out with your team. Anyway, right, I'm going to go back again, sorry, backwards and forwards. Um, no, that's the wrong, no, is that the right one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, just, hand, just a quick show of hands then. Is there anything, and I'm sorry the text is a bit small here, but is there something here that you haven't tried? Hands up if there's something on here that you haven't tried or you're just maybe a bit curious about, like, not sure what that is. Could be interesting. Maybe it's because you're just all so amazing already and you're already doing all of these things. Okay, so that, so that was just an idea, a, a, a concept at the moment. But in the meantime... Um, I'll give you this, a link to a few sort of things that I've been putting together, um, which is a much smaller connection, collection of tools for learning. And it has, it has a few bits and pieces in it. Some of it links to other people's stuff. A few, there's a few resources in there that you could use. There's some resources about reflective questioning, for example, which if you haven't tried it, you know, might be worth checking it out because, again, that's a skill that we can all cultivate within ourselves and and enhance our interactions with others to make them more learningful. Okay, so just to summarise then, um, learning is a process of making connections and building change potential, and whether that's with the goal of building knowledge or improving a system, um, it's kind of the same principle in essence. And in the complex socio-technical systems that we inhabit, um, learning goes further than knowledge and skills acquisition. And we all have a responsibility, I believe, as learning citizens to increase the learning capability of the systems that we are a part of and that we build and maintain. And by consciously adopting and trying to sort of nurture those social and technical practices that can support learning, um, that's how we can build health learning capability into our systems. And, yeah, so 
Uh, the question I'll just leave you with then is, you know, what will you add next to your learning toolkit? I, I mean, I think there's something for us all to learn here. It's, it's a lifelong process, trying to become better learners, trying to encourage or foster more learning in others. You know, it's something that we can all continue to work on. Um, so thanks for listening, and, and um, if you'd like to talk to me more about learning enablement um, for yourself or for your teams, then you can get in touch with me via LinkedIn. I'd love to have a chat, um, but thank you very much.